Public Research with Daniel Schwartz. Episode 10. Ron Campeas of the Jewish Telegraphic Agency on Israel-Palestine, October 7th, and the war in Gaza. So, um, must have been a boring month for you. Nothing really to write about, huh? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty eventful, that's for sure. I think just to, just to start out, you know, now we're a month into a war. I, I just want to start off just giving you opportunity just to sketch some thoughts about maybe what has surprised you most. I think the, uh, the start of the war surprised me most. Uh, the, the vulnerability that Israel uh, allowed itself to get into after having sort of depicted the, the, the Gaza wall or any of the walls that it, 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 it's built. It's built three walls effectively, one around Gaza, one through the West Bank, and then one along the border with Egypt to prevent infiltration by migrants from Africa. And, uh, and, and just that Israel is uh, this massively well-protected com- com- country. It's got a nuclear capability. It's got a massive uh, army, well-trained army, and yet they were uh, hugely vulnerable to, uh, and, and not only were they vulnerable, it's, it's, it's not as even as if uh, their soldiers were vulnerable. They left their civilians vulnerable. And for all the criticism that Netanyahu has sustained over the years, he, he's never, he, you know, he was Mr. Security. Uh, he was the guy who was protecting Israel. He uh, campaigned relentlessly for the year and a half. He was out of power recently by saying that the, uh, the, uh, the people who had replaced him were hapless, that they couldn't protect Israel like he could. Uh, he pointed to their deal with Hezbollah or the deal with Lebanon and Hezbollah to uh, create a, a safe zone for uh, mining gas in Lebanon as an example of that. You know, he called that naive, even stupid, and said it bolstered Hezbollah. In the meantime, as for as much as he was paying attention to the north, he wasn't paying attention to the south. And this has uh, this has devastated Israel. It's uh, it's devastating the Palestinians now. Obviously, it's changed things forever. Uh, and that that was the the big surprise. And I think also, I think everybody, you know, including Netanyahu, was was surprised by how savage the attack was there this it's almost as if uh israel for years said that hamas was a uh represented the worst of of palestinian political tendencies that it was a terrorist organization that it was eliminationist but you could see in the actions of netanyahu that it could almost didn't kind of believe it because on the other hand uh, Netanyahu is effectively sustaining Hamas by diminishing the Palestinian Authority, by diminishing Fatah, Hamas's natural rival, by allowing Qatar to funnel money into uh, the Gaza Strip, which Israel didn't even bother to try and control or to monitor where it went. Uh, and so that all conveyed the impression that, and this was, a, you know, I've read somewhere that this was a, conve- a, a Yahya Sinwar, the head of Hamas, wanted to convey this impression that um, Hamas was moderating, that it wanted nothing more than to eventually be recognized as the uh, uh, as the proper government in uh, in Gaza, that it uh, it was a it was a pothole uh, type government that they were trying to fix things. Uh, when and so when this burst out, this this it embodied certain nightmares. I think that the Israeli peoples have uh, have had about Hamas for years, but were maybe at a point where they were they were thinking maybe they they weren't quite real, that maybe there, there was a modus vivendi they could have with Hamas. Just a, a quick detour. Did you see the Haaretz article today about how Max Blumenthal, the son of Sidney Blumenthal, who runs the site called The Gray Zone, basically has been advanced? We've, we've seen the, the rise of basically this, this uh, atrocity denial about right. October 7th that uh, it's pretty vile stuff that, you know, the Jews killed the Jews, you know. Um, right, right. Uh, and I've just been wondering this, because we now have, to a degree that was not true 15 years ago, a lot of pretty prominent young anti-Zionist Jews who really despise Israel, like like Max Blumenthal, for instance. Do you, right. think, do you think there's any chance we're going to see some kind of modification of the right of return? Where like, yeah, not for Max Blumenthal or 
or Norman right. Finkelstein. Uh, I see what you're saying. I think that that's going to, I mean, you know, the, modif the, the, the one major modification of the right of return came with the Brother Daniels case, which I think was in the 1960s, in which somebody uh, who, who was assigned a, a priest or a monk or, or some sort of Catholic, Roman Catholic figure who was a, assigned a post in Haifa, at a church in Haifa, wanted to uh, emigrate under the law of return um, because he was born Jewish and he converted in his adult. And... Um, and he argued then he was correct that he was halachically Jewish. He was Jewish according to religious law because you can't, you can never renounce your Judaism. And the Supreme Court ruled that he, if that may be true, but uh, he effectively um, cut himself out of the Jewish people by embracing Christianity. That's a very tangible. That's a very tangible act of converting. I don't, you know, saying stupid things like Max does. It's, it's where do you draw the line? Who's who do you start excluding from going to Israel under the law of return? I know that there are people who are not as um, offensive as as Max, uh, but I think who are like, you know, anti-Zionists who have made Aliyah. Uh, it's as weird and as, I mean, made Aliyah, like not to become anti-Zionist after become, making Aliyah and after emigrating to Israel, but who went, there's somebody I think in the, the, the Women in Pink, I think it's called, I forget uh, forget what the group's called, who's, who's effect, who made Aliyah. And uh, nobody stopped her, nobody um, rejected her. So I think it would be such a, I don't think they want it to, I don't think they, they, they want to start that war. There are too many wars <laughs> over defining who is a Jew is already. I don't think it, I think it would be too hard for them to. Uh, right, right. Yeah, just, I, I'm not advocating that to be clear. I was just, it seemed like something that like uh, Ben G Giver, you know, Smotrich might have an idea for in the future. But um, uh, I, I, I was saying recently that, you know, um, anti-Semitism in America can often be uh, opaque topic. But I said one metric for if things are really getting bad in America will be if Max Blumenthal makes Aaliyah. <laughs> that, that will be a tangible metric. Um, <laughs> Where do so, things have happened? Yes. Yeah, so about October 7th, the fact that there were so many battalions in the West Bank instead of the South on that day, has within Israel, has that caused any kind of re-examination about the settlement enterprise in the West Bank? Uh I haven't seen that yet, but I think that uh, because the people who would criticize it, the people who would be most prone to criticize it are the people who were right. organizing the uh, the protests for a year against uh, Netanyahu's planned judicial reform. They were getting close to saying that the uh, the settlement enterprise were not, not just getting close. They had, like, for instance, after the settlers had, settlers had rampaged through the West Bank village of Hawara, um, they said that that was part of the problem. They were certain they're certainly not having happy having Betzalel Smotrich and Itamar ben in government. But I think uh, that could come, it's likely to come, but right now the same people who would make that connection uh, in Israeli society are preoccupied with um, fighting Hamas. Um, right, right, right. So, uh, I, yeah, I don't see that happening. I mean, I don't, say, I don't see it happening near term, but I do see it happening, uh, you know, as, as once the war tapers down, and Netanyahu faces a political accounting, I think that the his allies also face a political accounting and that there will be questions about how much is de, is devoted. Israelis, for a long time, they turned, they turned a blind eye to um, what the extremist settlers, it's not the entire settler movement, but what the extremist settlers were doing, like the settlers who had uh, rampaged through Hawara. It's going to come out that the, um, you know, that during this, uh, uh, war that the attacks on Palestinians by settlers in the West Bank intensified. Uh, it's going to come out that more Palestinians were killed in that period, and it's going. And, and and I think what is you know one conclusion that that sector of Israel is going to draw is that just you know at the moment that we were trying to contain this war to Gaza, that we didn't want it blowing up in other places, which would make it much less manageable. These people were were uh, creating that risk. And I think that that's going to be that's going to work against uh, the, the the settlement enterprise. I think. Right now, let's let's talk about the IDF campaign in Gaza. The, the casualty numbers. 
I'm not an expert. So it's the Hamas-run uh, Gaza Health Ministry. We we know they've gotten stuff wrong. Like, I think probably three weeks into war, maybe, they were still saying that Israel had only killed four members of Hamas, right? Or something right. like that. And right. also they said, five. I think they said 500 people died in the hospital bombing that was really, it was a, a missile on a parking lot and it wasn't 500 people. But how do you regard the the figures? I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, I think the figures are probably correct. I think that the the UN and uh, the World Health Organization have, uh, have validated them to a degree. I, I think that Israel has validated them to a degree. The reason we have, but because of those, uh, um anomalies you know or not just anomalies but but because of those errors uh unforced errors when they when they attributed the hospital bombing to israel when the health ministry attributed the hospital bombing to israel and then uh exaggerated the figure or maybe they didn't or overstated the figure um by a, a factor of five that means you still have to be a little bit wary of how of how they're counting and that's why it's important i think for our readers to know where the figures are coming i don't and, think and, and they could be lower like they could be their their numbers could be lower yeah yeah they, they might be underestimating us well we, we, we won't know until this this war is over it's funny it's like the two different sides are having totally different conversations one side is saying israel is trying to destroy hamas keep Israelis safe and a lot of my friends on the left are saying, this is genocide. This is a genocide. And they're not even uh, sort of in the same conversation. How do you make sense of this? Um, and, you know, I'm not going to, we're not going to use words like genocide or ethnic cleansing because there's just, there's no evidence that attaches itself to a, to an understanding of either term right now. You know, God forbid it could come to that. Uh, there, there had been, you know, talks on the far right of removing the population or much of the population of Gaza to Egypt voluntarily. You know, those situations, they're never quite voluntarily, voluntary, even when they are voluntary. It's still manifests as a form of ethnic cleansing, but that hasn't happened and nobody serious has actually uh, posited that. Uh, so until, you know, God forbid, those eventualities take place, I think it's it, it distorts the... Um, the reporting, it just standing of the reporting, and uh, and it, it doesn't really serve anybody well. It just right. it, sh it shuts right. down understanding rather than expands. Yeah. It. Let me rephrase my question. Do you think the IDF has been too aggressive, too brutal? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't. It's it's like it's hard to because uh, I'm not there. I'm not. Um, right. Right. I'm not seeing what the extent of the damage is and what I, mean, I do know. For instance, that the uh, the Biden administration is is unhappy with Israel for not being more targeted for be, for be, for using a hammer instead of a uh, you know a, a um, scalpel or <laughs> however you want to call it in terms of uh, of going to the Gaza Strip. I know that they've advised them of that. I know that there's an American perspective that while Israel has not you know committed genocide, uh, that it has not been as precise as it could be. I do know that also the Israel, uh, you know, whereas once it would have, you know, every army makes a calculus as to whether protecting a civilian population is worth what what risk is is it worth to their soldiers? And I know I think that Israel 50 years ago would have been erred more on the side of the civilian population. I think in the last 20 years or so, it errs more on the um, on the side of protecting the life of its soldiers. Whether that amounts to, um, ne you know, negligence that meets the definition of war crimes, I'm not sure. There, there has been that trajectory, I think. But, to, you know, to what degree that merits, you know, what that merits, whether it is the um, sort of quiet imprecations of the Biden administration or whether it is the kind of the all-out criticism of Israel, I'm, I don't know yet. Uh, there's been two... Um, op-eds published by members of the Netanyahu government, the Minister of Intelligence and Danny Danan, who was the uh, ambassador to the UN, and another guy whose name I'm forgetting wrote a uh, Wall Street Journal op-ed. And the gist of what the both are saying is after the war, you know, it might be good if other countries took many of the Gazans. 
it's a little bit disturbing for, for me personally to see that. It, it, it makes me wonder if that's sort of the hope is hey you know we're going to destroy hamas that's a sincere objective and we might end up like really damaging the all of gaza but and maybe in the end the, we can have a lot of the gazans go to sweden i mean do you have a sense of is that is that sort of a hope for this government? Is it the hope of this government? I don't know if it's the hope of this government. I think the gov this government, when it, you know, when it, uh, holistically, when it thinks of what, what happens after the war, is thinking of, of uh, what uh, costs the, um, you know, Israel the least. And there are, you know, never mind the, um, the moral considerations, which of course are substantial, but there are, uh, there were are huge, huge political risks for Israel <laughs> and even security risks for Israel in attempting to, carry out an operation like that. So I think that, I don't think that, I, I don't believe, I could be wrong, I don't believe that Netanyahu or others in his uh, <coughs> in his orbit would even contemplate like something like that. You're right, Danny Danone is a member of his Likud party, but he's kind of a, uh, he's a person who says, who's known for saying outrageous things. So it's, it's not, I don't, and he's just a, he's a backbencher right now. He was ambassador to the UN, but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't take what he says as as uh, the gospel of the party, or, or the the agriculture minister saying Nakba twenty. Right. You so right. you think he these are it, he's in such a weird context because they were asking him about they were asking him about the act of moving Gaza Gazans Palestinians from the uh, north of the Gaza Strip to the south of the Gaza Strip, and that was it. And he called that this is Nakba two Nakba two, but. Which is like it's you know the, the Nakba was not moving Palestinians a few miles in one direction or another. It was the outright uh, removal of them, whether you know by, by forceful expulsion, but because they were urged to by their um, compatriots, by others. The, in any case, these these people didn't just go a couple of miles away from their home. They went uh, they went far away. So I don't know why he was using that phrase. I think he was doing it to sound like you know like a tough guy. It, it didn't. Uh, didn't make much sense in context. Do you have any sense of what is the level of concern or awareness in, among Israelis about the sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, PR damage that figures like a Ben Giver or a Smotrich, who described himself as a, quote, homophobic fascist, I believe. He um, has described himself as that once, uh, yeah. The, 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 I mean, this is like, these people are just the greatest gift to, you know, the, the people who hate Israel. Do you sense that the Israelis care about this perception damage? Oh, I think they do. I mean, certainly, like, I mean, I, I'd say two things. I think they generally do in the long term. There was a lot of concern, like I said, before October the 7th, when Israelis were uh, protesting against the government about the, uh, the image that uh, Smotrich, not just Smotrich, so there's also an, a, a um, or, or Benvir, there's a, uh, there's a diaspora minister who managed to insult the diaspora. <laughs> Emma Shikli. quote Shikli. Yeah, Shikli. Yeah, and so that, you know, that, uh, I covered that, and then I was surprised to see the degree to which that was, even my coverage was becoming a, an issue for him in Israel, and he had to defend himself on, on TV. But I covered it in terms of like, um, how unhappy the, uh, the the American Jewish community was with him, but it refracted on him in Israel. So yes, I think they are very concerned about that kind of image. On the other hand, I'd say right now, in terms of the, what's going on in the war, they are not focused on what the uh, they're focused on what the international community thinks. They're focused on one particular member of the international community, that's President Joe, Joe Biden, and they're focused on the degree to which they can maneuver in the war. Uh, until on uh, the degree to which Biden will allow Israel to maneuver in the war. So they're not thinking so much about Israel's image right now. That's going to come back, though, I guess. I think. I'm pretty sure after the um, the war abates. Right. I, I keep forgetting that when I ask my questions, because this is such a small country where everybody is touched by right. everything that they are completely focused on the war, which is understandable. I think it's been about a decade since Netanyahu came to the United States and famously gave a speech in Congress, right? sort of thumbing his nose at Obama in 2012, I believe. 
Right. And it was seen as a That's 2015. 2015. Oh, was it? It was 2015? Yeah, it was, it was oh. in, just as the uh, Obama oh. administration was, there were other tense moments before then, but it was just as the Obama administration oh was consolidating its, um, its Iran nuclear deal. Ah. And that's what he got against. Okay, yeah. my mistake. Uh, well, <laughs> so not 10 years, but pretty close to 10 years. And a lot of people warned at the time, you know, Israel was, was a bipartisan sort of issue in America. People said, you know, Netanyahu shouldn't get in bed with the GOP so publicly and insult the Democrats. Right. Uh, we just had this massive pro-Palestine march in D.C. recently. Was that the fruits of this gamble? Do you think the gamble has paid off or has it backfired? Oh, no, it backfired. I think, uh, you know, and, oh, oh, sorry, Netanyahu, before October the 7th, was sort of twisting himself into pretzels and trying to justify the damage that had happened. And there was recognition, I think, in Netanyahu's circle about how much, I don't think they anticipated how angry Democrats were that he was doing that. I don't think they, they understood the, uh, the optics of a John Boehner, a white speaker of the House, saying the day after the, uh, the State of the Union address, now we're going to have somebody, effectively, I forget what he said, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, now we're going to have somebody serious talking about Iran because Obama had talked about Iran in the State of the Union and how that looked to black Democrats. Uh, you know, they, the, the, the white guy, the smart white guy is going to come and he's going to put our black president in his place. That's how it played out. I don't think they'd anticipated how deeply that was felt. I don't, they, 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 there are, there were, and there are still some black Democrats who are very, very pro-Israel. One for you know one who was who was consistently and un, unrelentingly pro-Israel was a, a guy who since retired Charlie Rangel from New York. They had to beg him to beg him to attend this speech by Netanyahu because they didn't want to have like a speech without a single black face. And so that's like how uh, that's how how much even Charlie Rangel felt the uh, the diss so to speak. And so um, yeah, and so like I said, Netanyahu has been twisting himself into pretzels into uh, advancing it. Now he says, most recently, I've heard the excuse uh, that the uh, that it led to the Abraham Accords because the Gulf states who were also wary of Iran saw that Netanyahu could even stand up to Obama and they were impressed. And it's like, you know, no, that's that's just uh, that's too attenuated that 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 excuse. And so it, it but it did. It created I think it created room for Democrats who were already wary of Netanyahu and his right-wing politics to openly write him off. And it, 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 there was, I mean, uh, I've covered this deeply. The, uh, there are a lot of uh, Jewish lawmakers. They're disproportionately more. I think now there are 34 in, the, in, in both chambers of Congress. There are, uh, and they have a lot of Jewish staffers, and there are a lot of Jewish staffers who work for um, non-Jewish lawmakers. And they were like mortified because, you know, they see it as part of their remit to um, to advance uh, U.S. policy and the Israel-U.S. alliance. Uh, they don't see that as a contradiction because they think that the Israel-U.S. alliance is good for the U.S. Uh, and then here comes somebody who just made it much more difficult. And they, in fact, they they began to I think rethink aspects of the U.S.-Israel alliance because they identified Israel with, uh, with Netanyahu. And it led to what, you're, you know, what you described earlier, that there is a lot of disillusionment among younger Jews with, um, with Netanyahu. And it wasn't just that speech. That speech was the, you know, the, the, dam, the breaking of the dam that opened the flood. But there was also his embrace of, uh, of Trump, uh, who was reviled by uh, a vast majority of American Jews. Uh, his eager embrace of Trump, and he, he, you know, he still hasn't doesn't get it. He just gave uh, today. He just gave Elon Musk a tour of a kibbutz, and Elon Musk has just recently been advancing like classic anti-Semitic white supremacist ideology. You know, you know, not just allowing it to advance, not just sort of hinting at it, but exp <laughs> expressly agreeing with it on on uh, on Twitter, you know, which he now owns. And so that kind of thing, those that kind of. Uh, deafness i think has um has been very bad for uh, for netanyahu it's proven it proved it to be a really bad bet for netanyahu and it proved that you know he it was a bad bet for israel as well i mean the uh the co-prime ministers of the of the government that lasted for a year and a half naftali bennett who came from the right and yair lapid, lapid who came from the center left and who worked together to try and build unity the one thing that they worked more hardest on i think was rebuilding the relationship with the 
American liberals, and, and also Netanyahu's president, Isaac Herzog, the guy who's president right now, he's also very dedicated to that proposition. They see it as enormous loss. I, I was really eager to speak to you because you've obviously been paying attention to Israel and the United States and, and these issues for a long time. When October 7th happened, my mind immediately went back to Munich. It, you know, it was actually bizarre. I was watching the movie Golda, actually, <laughs> the day before October 7th, and which is uh, uh, irony. But I thought about Munich, right? And especially when I was watching some people on the left, sort of the gross reaction, the famous tweet of, what did you think decolonization looked like, writing essays, which right. was famous. And then I, my mind is like, oh, is this new or has this always been this way? Because I remember the movie Munich, which obviously was based on real events. And I remember the Bader Meinhof gang and right. they, the contempt they had for Israelis, even back in the 70s. So how, how much are we seeing something new in the discourse about Israel and how much are we not? Uh, yeah, I think that this is I think that this has always been um in evidence on, on parts of the left. It's certainly, it's a kind of view of Israel that informed Soviet anti-Zionism, which was, you know, which which is why there were like, before you had um, radical Islam as one of the competing ideologies in the Middle East, you had that kind of far left embrace of of Soviet anti-Zionism and that, and that was very popular in these. And a lot of the critiques that you're getting now from the far left, they're familiar uh, in uh, from that period. I think it had abated for a long time because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, or it's uh, the fact, or the it wasn't really noticed. It was thought that it, uh, I mean, you know, there was a period when, you know, for Israelis, if you're looking at it from an Israeli perspective, you had this isolation from the rest of the world, or from not the rest of the world, but a big chunk of the world, uh, up until the collapse of the Soviet Union, and then with the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was simultaneously with the Oslo peace talks in the early 1990s. You had a rush of countries uh, recognizing Israel and uh, doing business with Israel because you know there was no longer any incentive to cut off Israel because the the Russians they, they weren't really um, you know the post-Soviet Russians were they were recognizing Israel they were embracing Israel so why would other kind of, why would their satellites uh, to the degree that they remain satellites not recognize Israel and also Israel had become an economic powerhouse it made no sense. To, uh, to cut off a, a source of commerce and a source of know-how. And so that that happened, and I think the Israelis thought that, that a lot of that was behind them, and particularly because of the Abraham Accords and in relations with four Arab countries that uh, had previously been unimaginable. I think they ignored the degree to which I'm not sure that it's necessarily these thoughts about this, you know, this rejection of eliminationist ideas about Israel necessarily had disappeared, but they uh, they ignored the degree to which they were still nascent in certain parts of the uh, of the uh, in intelligentsia on the far left and um, how quick they were to uh, to return. Do you know the Rabbi Eric Asherman by any chance? Oh yeah, um, yeah. Rabbis for Human Rights. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he's a guy, and I heard him speak a few years ago, and it was really powerful and this guy has been stabbed multiple times by these very extreme settlers who he right. basically when they go to harass like a Palestinian oil farmer in the West Bank, he just like sort of stands there and sometimes right. he'll like quote the Torah, this is wrong. And so it's very powerful work that he does, I think. And I I see stuff like that and Young people see stuff like the, 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 the behavior of these most extreme settlers going into people's houses saying, you have 24 hours to leave, you know, with a gun on their back. Right. Uh, and the IDF doesn't seem to, we don't, or maybe they do, but I don't see them arresting these people. I don't see them cracking down. And then you hear about yeah. the Israeli minister who oversees the West Bank is like supportive and... It, and it always seemed to me, if Israel is after the war, if they really are worried about young people turning against Israel, hey, there's one easy gesture. Just start arresting these people. Like, make a show of that. Or is yeah. that just too much of an ask? I mean, is that possible? Israel's greatest weakness, I think, has always been how to deal with uh, 
the settler movement, they've managed to represent themselves in the Israeli imagination. It's at times, not always, as inheritors of the people who, you know, who built the country before 1948. You know, one of the greatest paradoxes I've, I noticed, and I noticed this years ago about the settlers, is that they, they, they treat the Israeli government, which is the manifestation of Zionism. You know, this is like what we wanted was to, uh, to, to govern ourselves, to, to have sovereignty. But they treat it as an occupier. They treat it like they're still like the British. They're still, you know, the British mandate. They, they, um, they go and they build settlements in the middle of the night. Sometimes that they're they're dragged away, and there's just this, uh, this inherent unhappiness, not unhappiness. There's just an inherent reluctance among the Israeli establishment to treat them like they would others who were doing these things. You know, if Palestinians uh, sort of snuck into Israel, built a, you know, green line and built a settlement in the middle of the night, <laughs> you know, it would last five seconds. But the, um, but they do this and they, uh, they claim, um, you know, they, they, they claim the a biblical mandate, mandate, which is very uh, culturally appeal appealing to certain parts of the Israeli uh, populace they claim that they're the inheritors like i said of the pioneers they take risks they imagine them you know they they present themselves as as heroic and sometimes people buy that and i think um that's that's the reluctance that's like the uh, you know like you know i was in the israeli army and years and years ago and and i i, I was in a program for people who were um drafted when they were already well into adulthood i was 28 um and so they don't have this anymore but it was like a you know, four months training, and then you go into the due reserves with everybody else. And so we were trained, the people who were training us were very talented young people who were much younger than us. They were 20 or 21. And uh, I just remember um, getting uh, open fire orders, and um, there was a and there was a this standing order, that at least then, not to open fire on people, let's say, who were about to throw a stone, because it just didn't justify the... Uh, the lethal lethal force but if they were about to throw a molotov cocktail even if they were like if they were carrying a molotov cocktail you didn't open fire but if they were had it and they were about to throw it then you could open fire and then uh, in the rare instance where you saw somebody with a gun because this was about the intifada it wasn't yet about actual warfare it was a completely different thing if you saw somebody with a gun and they were about to fire on somebody then you could open fire to protect life and i just i put up my head and and i said and it was 1989 Eight, and I said, "What if the um, what if the purpose person with the gun is a rogue settler, and what if the person he's aiming at is a Palestinian? Do we open fire on the settler?" And the poor young guy, you know, was just completely flustered. He didn't know what to say. He said, "That's just never going to happen." And of course, wow. subsequently, has multiple times. They didn't know how to deal with it. They didn't want to think about it. You know, it's like that. I think that was typical in the sense that they, they just never wanted to imagine that situation where you would have to open fire on a, on a fellow Jew. Uh, who was about to come. And, you know, and the, the, the problem with that is that they, they let their guard down. And I don't think they realized the viciousness and the, um, the anger that fueled the far right in Israel, that fueled the people who, who uh, backed the extremist settlers and, and would culminate it in the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Um, they did, you know, there was, a, there was a known threat. And they, again, they didn't take it seriously. And I think that's part of it. They just didn't imagine that Jews would open fire on Jews, although it's, it's happened multiple times or you know or that there would be situations in which you would have to use uh, force to protect palestinians from jews so the situation seems to me to be this the majority of palestinians don't believe that there should be the existence of israeli state and the majority of israelis don't believe there should be a palestinian state now right. is that the situation it varies. I think that when a um, it, when a two-state solution looks viable, when uh, there's a relative peace on both sides, and you have leaders who seem to be willing to carry it out, it becomes much more popular on both sides. So um, I think it, it varies in that sense. You know, they, the Palestinians and the Israelis both want peace, and they both want to go about with their lives, but they want. Uh, they want it to happen in a way that's viable. And so like you have like people favoring a one state solution, you know, fa among the Palestinians when the two state solution just doesn't seem achievable. But once it, then it, when it does seem achievable because you've got political will on those occasions and it's been like 15 years since that happened the last time, it becomes more popular. But uh, so I'm not sure that, it's, you know, it's necessarily 
set in stone that the Palestinians don't want to. I don't think that they're like, you know, I don't. There are some of them who actually like the idea of like having a Jewish state next door in, in one way or the other, like a, a few in the intelligentsia. I don't, but generally, I don't think that necessarily the Palestinians, you know, want uh, a, a Jewish state next door. But they 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 can be persuaded to live with one under certain cer certain circumstances and vice versa. Do you know Caroline Glick? Yeah, I don't know her personally. But I don't know. <laughs> So I, I'm obsessed with Israeli politics. Uh, so I, I I don't speak Hebrew, but I follow it. And the, one of the ways I, I'm able to sort of keep tabs on what the Israeli right or sort of far right maybe is thinking is I watch her show on JNS. And I know she wrote a book. Uh, I think it was called the one, maybe the one state solution or something. Well, but the, I, there are these people on the Israeli far right who also who do believe in a one state solution, right, you know, a right. very different kind. But can you sort of explain what is the Smotrich vision for the West Bank? I think that uh, I think that it, it does in that, you know, in their utopian, their version of utopia does involve like Palestinians just leaving because uh, it's, they're no longer they finally recognize that the, this isn't their land. They have some sort of delusion that that could happen. Otherwise, that's the thing, you know, try and pin down somebody down on how this functions. You know, how does it work when when Palestinians are, when you're having your one state? How's that, you know, they'll, you know, they'll talk about a certain type of, you know, limited representation on the municipal level. Uh, that's one thing they'll talk about, the, the ones who are more moderate, the ones who aren't Smotrich. The ones like, for instance, who live in, uh, in Gush Etzion, which is a, a block of settlements south of Jerusalem near Bethlehem, and they're known for being more moderate uh, in, in their outlook. And these are, you know, and, and these are, you know, they're decent people. They're, they actually try and um, assist the Palestinians, which is, which is in, a, in a sense, it's ironic because they, they're, it's because they're actually in the, you know, go out and they try and figure out the bureaucracy for the Palestinians and help the Palestinians through the bureaucracy and and get things to the Palestinians at the set they 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 know what they're, they're that they're, there are inequities um but they still kind of imagine a future where there wouldn't be and so uh, the problem is that you know government isn't government is holistic uh, self-rule is it's a it's a holistic thing you can't you can imagine maybe a world in which somebody sort of like runs their municipality and they have garbage pickup and everything smooth but and the and they're and they're doing well but if you know if you're not really it's not like foreign trade it's not like foreign policy it's not like security policy are utterly divorced from that kind of governments you do need for a, a sovereign for sovereignty to work you do actually do need some kind of say in that i mean and so the the classic example is that when oslo happened there was this whole thing but while israel was still sovereign and still like actually running the west bank that they would facilitate the export of palestinian produce so that the palestinians could um have the same markets that the israel was used to and vice versa and it never happened because the israeli agricultural industry was never going to give up its preeminence because it meant it it's like the, no capitalist enterprise is going to do that you're you're making money and for ideological reasons, you're going to ask to, to actually help a competitor. It doesn't work that way. You need to, you, you, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to, you're going to, you know, be a town that's adjacent to some farms and they want to sell their produce. At one point, if they have to run through an Israeli bureaucracy, not just a Palestinian bureaucracy, things are going to get screwed up and people are still going to want to have national sovereignty. So they, they don't really have effective answers for that. They never get that deep into it. And I, I don't, I'd like to know what their answers are absent giving the Palestinians a vote or getting two states, but I haven't heard any viable answers yet. I remember hearing that the Smotrich figures like that want to annex part of the West, West Bank. Can you explain what part of the West Bank? So uh, basically, I think they want to annex all of it, Smotrich, etc. cetera. What, uh, with Netanyahu, wants to annex is Area C, because Area A is, uh, this is what I was talking about, ostensibly under full Palestinian control, but it's not. Israel enters, it. Israeli forces enter Area A whenever they want to. Area B is kind of, is uh, is under, supposedly under civilian Palestinian control, under Israeli security control. Again, it's not an arrangement that really functions. And Area C is, is land that's supposed to be resolved at some future date. And so, uh, 
uh, and it's um, it's kind of a lot of farmland. It's less populated. Uh, Canada and um, sorry, Canada. How did I say Canada? Uh, the um, it's less populated. The 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 popul much of the Palestinian population is concentrated in areas A and B. But area C has a lot of arable farmland. <laughs> it's also necessary for Palestinians in the area in A and B cities to cross through area C to make it contiguous. Etc. And um, that's what Netanyahu had hoped. Part, not all of it, but he wanted to, as part of the uh, the peace plan that the Trump administration was advancing. And this is separate from the Abraham Accords. This is the actual Palestinian peace plan. He hoped to uh, annex parts of it, and that actually brought him into tension with at least um, a part of the Trump administration. You know, one of its most important part, the uh, Jared Kushner, Trump's son-in-law, who actually wanted to. Uh, he, you know, once it, it's interesting what happens when you actually start involving yourself in negotiating peace, you, you become invested in, a, in an equitable outcome. And so Kushner actually, uh, even though he didn't uh, advocate for a two state solution, he wanted to give the Palestinians as much as they could so that they could get, achieve some sort of uh, sovereignty. And that, so that's what brought him into conflict with Netanyahu. If you uh, look, uh, Kushner's book, you'll see that. And so in the annexation, what happens with the Palestinians? Do they become Israeli citizens? So there are like um, in the areas of Peri Area C that Netanyahu would want to fully annex. Uh, so this has been discussed and it's been discussed for years. Like I said, the, some of the people who live in Gush Etzion, like where the relatively moderate less settlers live, have talked about this. Yes, they would become Israeli citizens because there may be like, uh, you know, a total couple of hundred thousand of them who actually live there. So that wouldn't uh, that wouldn't affect the uh, the demographic balance in Israel. Okay, so the, the, is this the idea? The idea is this. We're going to annex the parts that aren't become mostly Jewish. So it right. won't. And, and yeah, we'll give the Palestinians their to citizenship, but it won't really matter because the math won't really change that much. Is that basically the idea? Yeah, that's one of the ideas. Okay. That's one of the ideas. Okay. For sure. Yeah. So I listened to, and I'm going to butcher this Israeli name, Anit Wolf. Wolf. Oh, Anit Wolf. Anit Wolf. Yeah. Anit Wolf. Yeah, I was listening to her on a podcast. And she was saying, you know, Israelis are fine with the Palestinian state, basically. And we've been reaching out for peace over and over again. And the Palestinians just, they just don't, can't accept a Jewish state. And and I understand that argument. And, and those people definitely have a case. That, you know, they say that there's been nine offerings. And certainly Israel has offered. And certainly uh, the Palestinians have walked away you know, Camp David 2000 in ways I think are totally tragic. But it seems to me this argument, it doesn't really, it's, it's after like a decade of Netanyahu governance and, and that sort of, their sort of policy in the West Bank with settlements. I don't know if that argument holds water anymore because my question for her would be, well, is the settlement policy in the West Bank reaching out for peace? It right. seems like they've just given up on that. I mean, what what do you think? No, I think you're right. I think that's a um, it's a good question uh, because uh, you know I think that two different peoples with two different types of uh, power, like obviously in, in a lot of sectors, the Israelis are much more powerful and have much greater agency than the Palestinians. So the 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 sins against getting to a peaceful outcome are going to be different in both sides. And so, like you said, and like Anad Wolf has said, I think the Palestinians didn't see certain opportunities. I, I think like, you know, one of the, the most obvious instances is actually Annapolis in 2007, 2008, because they were, their their problem with it at the time was that Ehud Olmert was, you know, under, it was facing indictment. I don't think he was under indictment yet. He was facing, and then eventually he did go to jail for corruption. Uh, and they said, okay, you're asking us, like, why didn't we accept this offer? Well, the prime minister was a lame duck prime minister. But that's not, you know, Israel isn't the United States. Uh, once El Hubdomer goes, his policies don't go. Uh, he was about to hand off, and he did hand off uh, the leadership of the party that Tzipi Livni, who was every bit as committed to uh, the, the same things he was. And uh, had the Palestinians actually played ball, Tzipi Livni might have actually won the subsequent uh, election. And, and so it's a, so they really, you know, they, they, um, I think that part of the problem is that the Palestinian political leadership there are certain 
acceptances that they would have to make of, uh, of Jewish statehood, of Jewish sovereignty, of a Jewish historical claim that are very, very difficult for them to make. It's very interesting that often it always comes back down to, do the, do the Jews have a, actually any kind of stake in the Western Wall, which is weird because obviously the, the archeology span and the history bears out a, a, Jewish, um, a Jewish history at the Western Wall and at the temple site. Uh, and so, but then they go into paroxysms of denial and weird sort of explanations about why that's not true. So that's on the uh, Palestinian side. On the Israeli side, you've had like a very generous sort of call. I don't like calling it generous, but very expansive offers uh, that would uh, that would result in a Palestinian state. But it's weird because in the meantime, you also have what you what you describe this sort of this uh, this settlement that mitigates against the Palestinian state. Like the uh, the open question is like, uh, you know, I know exactly what the mentality is, but the. It's it's anomalous that you, if you if you want if you're if you're actually a, like a concerned about security in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and you think that the you know and, and Netanyahu's and yes there's there's a certain logic to this if you if Israel gives up security control of the um, of the Jordan River of the border with Jordan Jordan is not exactly the most stable uh, country they could be overrun by Al Qaeda you could have this sort of the same thing happening. Uh, from the east as now is happening with from the west with Gaza. These are all legitimate concerns. And so in that case, establish a very strong security protocol there. Say that you're not going to um, give up security control of that area until you're, you know, until you're absolutely certain that uh, you, that you're that you're going to be living in an absolutely peaceful Middle East, which might not be in our lifetimes. But don't settle the area. What does settlements have? What do putting placing civilians in those areas have to do with security? They actually. You're making them less secure. Why, why is that a why is that a security imperative? And so that it's not. It's a national imperative, and the national imperative mitigates against a, a Palestinian state and against a two-state out, outcome. And that's uh, what's hard to uh, uh, and and that's you know and that's the like you said that's the um, that is the Israeli sin, sin against uh, to come to a peaceful outcome. Yeah, I, yeah, I think we're we're a long way off from any kind of solution it is very funny though in america among like young democrats the the fashion now is it's all about forget the two-state solution it's all about one state solution let's just say it happened tomorrow okay everybody in israel palestine is now one state do you have you thought about how that would play out you know i mean i think there, there are people who certainly advance it i think it's something that rashida Tlaib, for instance uh talks about i mean you you see the uh, the issue with it now how do you uh, how do you coexist with the mutual hatreds and um i mean it, it, it could happen um but it, i don't see any i mean you need leadership for it to happen you need grassroots action for it to happen which is what happened in northern ireland and i'm not seeing either right now the grassroots is is uh as, as you know there there have been efforts to uh encourage it to a degree there have been some encounters but it's it's much more difficult than it was in ireland you have like a i think it's an anti-normalization or or uh among palestinians because they say israel is so much more powerful that one shouldn't normalize that by engaging with israelis and uh so how do you you know how do you get grass there are grassroots peace movements but how do you expand them if that that's like a uh a prevailing outlook and then you you have you don't have a exactly the same thing as like i said the israelis and the palestinians are dif different in the way they sin against peace but you do have this attitude among a lot of israelis why should we discuss it with the palestinians they're not going to listen to us anyway so yeah i mean i, I just uh I, I don't know how you get there where you'd have the culture that would be necessary just for uh, for uh, peaceful coexistence to prevail and that's why you know it, I think that's why the people who advocate for two states realize how difficult that's become, but also just despair of anything else working. Um, you know, you, a one state solution, however well intentioned, could end up looking like October the 7th over and over again. Uh, and that's, no, you know, that's what it reminded Israelis of. It reminded them of uh, they had historical memory, and there are people still alive, but it had historical memory of the of the uh, the massacres and the uh, attacks that predated the uh, establishment of the state of Israel. Yeah, I'm I'm still a two state guy. You know, Robert Wright, who I I'm a huge fan of. He did an interview with Daniel Siderman, 
and uh yeah yeah it, it was like a ray of sunshine out of the darkness i was like yes finally can we make this guy the prime minister of israel like you know <laughs> but um he's a yeah he's a good guy you know he's a he's he's really like invested and he uh, he's dedicated to what he does danny danny Simon. <laughs> The most influential book right now in sort of the young left, I think, is Elon Pape's book on Palestine. He's sort of the hot author on the subject. Well, do you have any thoughts on Pape? I haven't been, I haven't like engaged with him, his ideas in years, so not really uh, any deep thoughts about that. Other than what I just said, that the people who like advocate you know, the intellectuals who advocate for a one-state outcome, I don't think are really in touch with the practicalities on the ground. Wait, what do you make of the settler colonial accusation? I think the people who, who embrace and advance that idea, they, they need to structure a historical narrative that doesn't align with actual history in order to do it. And that, that is that the, um, the European powers were absolutely instrumental. And certainly like, you know, obviously there was, uh, there were like the Balfour Declaration helped. The, the UN vote in November 29th of 1947 helped, but the people who brought it around were actual individual Jews who moved to Palestine, built settlements, built a, a self-governance, which was called the Yishuv before it became Israel, and then fought for it. I remember like talking to a guy, uh, a colleague, Jack Katzenel, who was a late reporter for the Associated Press. He was a, he was a good guy. We were talking about like, you know, uh, Israel faced six armies in 1948. Why did the armies fold so easily? Um, what? Uh, how come the Palestinians weren't as uh, fierce as people thought they would be? And he said, you know, he came, I'd come to Israel in 1978. He'd come in like mid 60s before the Six Day War. And he was always a journalist. And he said, I've interviewed people who fought in the, uh, the independence war. And they really felt that they had no place to go. You know, it was like, you know, it's like what Golda told the Joe Biden. Uh, in his telling, in Biden's telling, they you know they'd come out of the Holocaust Europe. Um, they really didn't have any faith in the world actually setting up a viable place for Jews to be safe at that time. Remember, a lot of the thinking at the time was that the Nazis had not gone away completely; that they were coming back. They um, and remember that the, some Jews who tried to return to their communities in Europe at the time were were shunned were even in a couple of cases massacred and those those stories spread very quickly and so there were a lot of jews who tried to get to the united states which was difficult to get into in canada and australia they wanted to get as far away from from europe as possible and there were a lot of jews who went to who said the the best chance we're getting, we have is is palestine and that's why they fought and so that is you know it's it's uh, it, it on the one hand one has to take into account in terms of understanding 1948, the, the displacement of the Palestinians, what they call the Nakba, and how traumatic that was for them. But calling the, simply reducing that to some colonial exercise when there was no colonizing power, there were simply people who were moving to what they believed and what they had for centuries regarded as their historic homeland. It's just two different things. And it's not to say that an injustice wasn't done and it doesn't have to be reckoned with in terms of what happened to the Palestinians, but it's just, it's ahistorical to call it colonization and, and it's willful and it, and you know, whatever, wherever it comes from, you know, out of sympathy for the Palestinians and wanting to right a perceived wrong to the Palestinians, it dehumanizes Jews <coughs> because what makes was it, what was an essentially Jewish action, one that was in line with, uh, like I said, centuries, millennia of Jewish teaching and Jewish longing, it turns it in, it turns them into just an instrument of a, of somebody else's uh, power. You know, which is a, it's a bit of an anti-Semitic trope. There is like a, there is a, a separate trope about Jews that, uh, oh, you can't really blame them for being rapacious because they were forced to be rapacious. They were forced to, forced into usury by uh, medieval Christian kings. I mean, and there's a grain of truth to that, but it's like. That's it. It reduces Jews to simply being instruments of other capitalists, of capitalists, or of um, of a hierarchical system, rather than understanding them as like a, a hugely compl complex and uh, and uh, and broad based and and deep culture. You know, and it, it, it's dehumanizing. And I think that's the same thing for people who accuse Israel I, of being a colonizer. I don't know if you've seen this, but the. These people on Twitter are now taking the the footage of Israeli hostages waving 
and they're being told by the Hamas people, keep waving in Arabic. And they're taking screenshots and saying, get yourself a woman that looks at you like this Israeli hostage looks at the yeah, Hamas people. It's just, it's, gross. I mean, it's, just, it's just, you know, it's gross. It's again, it's, it's dehumanized. Like it's not, uh, um, it's not uh, taking into account that, uh, of course, people who are scared are going to do like, um, are going to uh, do what their captors want them to do because they're afraid for their lives. I do believe it is possible for people to be anti-Zionist, really hate Israel, and not be anti-Semitic. Right. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's possible. I mean, um, you know, I once had this discussion with Abe Foxman, who directed the Anti-Defamation League before Jonathan Greenblatt took it over until 2015. And he said, theoretically, there's a type of anti-Zionist who just hates any national expression, who doesn't believe in any sort of ethno-nationalism. But I don't know if that person exists because, you know, he was saying that there are people, and he was right, there are people who embrace other forms of nationalism who do, who would deny it to Israel. And that is a kind of like, it's a kind of, it's it's at least a path to anti-Semitism if you're gonna have that idea. But, but I think when he says that person doesn't exist, that's where I disagreed with him. Those people do exist. There are people who absolutely reject any kind of nationalism whatsoever. You know, I remember being at a, at a conference of some academic umbrella group and they were debating whether to um, boycott Israel academically. This is about 10 years ago. And somebody said, uh, you know, why not, why, if you're gonna boycott Israel, why not boycott New Zealand? And somebody in the audience said, well, if, if the Maoris appeal to us to boycott New Zealand, I would do it in a minute because I don't believe in New Zealand either. So absolutely, there are people like that. And they, uh, so, but, uh, and they're not anti-Semitic, but, but I think that once, it, you know, there are anti-Zionists who embrace, and you see it, like you, you talked about it just now, people who embrace uh, Hamas as a resistance, who, who, see, who glorify and elevate Palestinian nationalism. I mean, actual nationalism, not just the Palestinians, you know, who are a culture or embracing the Palestinians. Obviously, there are people who are in need and who deserve our sympathy, but actually embrace Palestinian nationalism. And so you're saying, you're, all you're doing is really saying elevating one nationalism over another. And in that sense, if you're saying that this, if this works for you in every single case, nationalism works for you in every single case, except for Israel, then you, you might have a problem going there. Can Israel survive without U.S. support? Yeah, I think it could survive. It couldn't survive very happily, but it could survive for sure. Any thoughts on Norman Finkelstein? Yeah, I don't know what happened to him. He's become like very sort of acerbic and he seems to revel in just attacking and saying the opposite of whatever somebody he disagrees with says. If you look at him in the, in the 1980s, uh, if you look at his debates online with people like this one where he's debating Wolf Blitzer actually in 1989, it's kind of reasonable. He's like an interesting guy, but he's became, I think he became very embittered. I don't know. I mean, I shouldn't speak for him. I shouldn't project what, uh, but he has certainly become less rational of late. His debate with Alan Dershowitz, one of the classics. If you Have you ever seen that one? No, I should look oh. it up. Though. Oh, that it's on like YouTube. It, it's, it's from like 2004. It's like, excuse me, Mr. Dershowitz. I read your <laughs> book two times. Yeah, it's really great. So anti-Semitism in the U.S. One of the things I ask all my guests is, um, okay, so let's just go anti-Semitism in America from zero to 100. And let's say in 2004, it was a 27, okay? Mm -hmm. What's the number today? Uh, more like in the 40s, I'd guess, I think. So that's what most people have said, like a doubling, yeah. Right. What do you think of this? demon person named Nick Fuentes. Oh, he's an anti-Semite. He's a professional anti-Semite. I don't know if he b believes what he says, but he's, you know, he's definitely an anti-Semite. It's a full-time job for him. Um, you know, in terms of his Holocaust denial, in terms of his, uh, um, his, you know, blaming Jews uh, for, uh, for being uh, overweening controllers of uh, everything that happens, it's bad. He's an anti-Semite. 
You've seen many anti-Semites. I've seen many anti-Semites. There's something about him that's always struck me about is especially evil. I think it's the grinning. The sort of yeah, yeah. No, like I said, he's a, he, he's a troll, and he you know he he revels in it. So yeah, for sure. How worried are you about the Gen Z right? I don't know yet. It's hard to say. I mean, you know, I covered the trial of Robert Bowers in Pittsburgh, the man who killed uh, eleven people in a synagogue in 2018. And um, he's not Gen Z, he's 48. But his commitment to anti-Semitism, his commitment to Jew violence against Jews was extraordinary. And you see it online. And I don't, you know, you, one can never say like to what degree that it's, um, uh, it's, it's penetrated, but you see it online, you see it among young people. And after seeing that, you know, what were really sort of vile ideas translated to like the worst action ever taken against Jews in history and seeing that those ideas, you know, you saw I mean, Charlottesville was Gen Zers, you know, <laughs> so, and so a lot of them were Gen, not all Gen Zers, but there were a lot of Gen Zers in, in, uh, in Charlottesville. And so uh, when you see that, I, I can't say right now, Gen Z is too young, it hasn't developed uh, enough yet, but uh, you, there's certainly the possibility for, for, uh, for, the, for, for some Gen Zers and generating a resurgence of, uh, of anti-Semitism. Who could replace Netanyahu? My concern is none of the alternatives, I don't think their English is good enough. Do you think it's <laughs> Gantz? Gantz, it, it, it's interesting because I, I, I knew Gantz glancingly when he was the military attaché here back in the 2000s, and he didn't impress me as somebody who was like, you know, a great orator, but his Hebrew speaking, it's like, it's it's soaring. It's, uh, I just like, uh, I'm able to listen to it. Like when, I'm, when I've got like the radio on in the background and I hear him speaking, I haven't watched him yet, but I'd like to see Bibi's face because he's really, Gantz is really, really good in Hebrew. And, you know, he would, he would win hands down. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that would be interesting is that there, uh, although, although polls show Gantz winning and, uh, and besting and, and even like somebody like Naftali Bennett, who everybody wrote off because he no longer was attached to a, a political party after he left the prime ministership. He, you know, people are talking, he, he volunteered, he put on his, uh, khakis and headed straight to the front on the, on October the 7th. And that's the kind of sort of showing up that counts for a, a huge amount in Israel. So that's another person I wouldn't count out either. You can find Ron Campeas's reporting on all aspects of Jewish affairs at jta.org.